right, thanks very much. Um, so you've had two excellent speakers, um, you know, who've given 30,000 foot views of all the exciting work that's going on at TAC and LRZ. I'm gonna take uh, a level down. So I'm gonna, you know, at the 3,000 foot level maybe, uh, I'm gonna chat about a specific issue of performance and productivity. Frankly, um, you know, when you, when you think about simulation users running on big HPC systems, they've always, always put performance first and productivity has been second. If you look at how the data science community thinks about big machines and doing analysis, they think about productivity first and performance is always the, the second thing. So how do we exactly play this trade off? How, do, how does this play out at a place like NERSC? Uh, that's gonna be the topic of this particular talk. So um, this is the, the outline. So I'm gonna be chatting about some trends and different technologies uh, in, in the data intensive science space at NERSC. And then we're gonna talk about what motivated the big data center collaboration. I wanna spend most of my time on actual case studies. So there are gonna be four case studies where, where we've taken productive technologies and scaled them out on the Cori system that we have at NERSC. And then we're gonna conclude. So a few obligatory slides. So NERSC, just in case you don't know, is the, is the mission HPC facility for the Office of Science in the DOE. Uh, probably one of the more interesting things about NERSC is the sheer breadth of domain sciences that we work with. So anywhere from astronomy and cosmology and uh, climate science to high energy physics and fusion and plasma science. Uh, we have about 7,000 users at this point in time, and they routinely run about 700 different codes on our systems. This is a snapshot of our hardware. Um, so Cori is, is the flagship machine for NERSC right now. Uh, Cori is a KNL system, so we have a 9,600 node KNL partition, and then we have a 2,000 node Haswell partition. If you're a data user, then uh, IO is extremely important to you. And I think similar to some of the issues that Dan mentioned, uh, conventional file systems like Lustre and GPFS just don't keep up. So we have a burst buffer, a uh, one and a half petabyte size burst buffer array that we read and write data from. Uh, the other aspect that's important is moving your data from one supercomputing center to another. So we have the energy sciences network that lets us uh, do that. So for the last 40 years or so, NERSC has supported simulation workloads. And I would say that maybe in the 10 year, last 10 years, uh, data workloads have become certainly much more important. And for our group, for the last five years, I would say the primary challenge was to articulate what the data stack needs to look like uh, on, on the machine. So it's gonna be a single KNL system that's gonna support both simulation and data workloads. Uh, so what are the right set of technologies that we need to present to our users? So we think of it similar to, I think, what was mentioned in the TAC presentation. We think of a range of different capabilities that we need to support. So there's tools for data transfer, data access, workflows, data management. So you have a bunch of IO middleware that you can use, but also database technologies. Uh, we have uh, some visualization tools. But really, a lot of the buzz right now in the big data space is in analytics. So the range of, there is a range of different technologies. So again, modern programming languages like Python, statisticians really need R. Uh, modern frameworks like, like Spark are important. Uh, languages like Julia are certainly coming up. Uh, they are really important as well. Uh, in the deep learning space, I would say that uh, TensorFlow, Cafe, Keras, PyTorch, those are the key technologies that we uh, support at, at NERSC. I'm gonna go into a little more depth into these technologies shortly. So we've been monitoring how different users have been using our, our stack uh, over the past few years, and there are some really important trends. Uh, so on the x-axis of this plot, you see a number of unique users who've used the stack or that particular technology over the last 12 months and along the rows are uh, you know, different technologies. So first up, Python. Uh, it's used by about 2,000 users at this point in time. Five years ago, I think if you were to go to a conventional HPC center and say you, know, you wanna use Python for your analytics, sysadmins would have given you a really hard time. Uh, you know, is this really the right language for you, so on and so forth. But now, a language like Python is absolutely indispensable uh, at, at a place like NERSC. Then you can see Jupyter, so again, that's a, a high productivity framework for developing code and sharing code, used by over 600 users at this point in time. Uh, certain different, uh, different libraries in Python, like HDF5 and HCDF, are being used routinely. Uh, and at this point in time, for deep learning, we have anywhere from 100 to 200 users at this point in time. So uh, I wanna to touch upon two technologies that we routinely use in production. One is Shifter, that is a container technology based off Docker, uh, and the other is the, the Jupyter framework. So first, just a quick word on, on containers. Um, you know, we've talked about reproducible science for 
many, many years. Um, I think we are finally at a stage where we can probably pull it off. Um, so in order to make sure that science is reproducible, uh, in order to make sure that your workflow can be migrated from one system to another, uh, just having flexibility in what sort of, sort of technologies compose your stack, and then more importantly, maybe sharing your, your workflow with other users is a key requirement for many areas in science. And I think the container technologies right now, I think, have sufficiently matured that we can probably pull it off. So Shifter is a system that's based off Docker, and we d we've deployed it at NERSC uh, to essentially get these images up and running on our systems. And it has been broadly adopted by, by our user community. So at this point in time, uh, three, more than 350 users use Shifter all the time. There are more than 700 unique images, and uh, routinely 400 million plus images have been looked up during different jobs uh, at, at runtime. I want to share one success story. Um, so there's a particular code called uh, Toast, which is used by the, uh, the CMB community uh, to essentially run large-scale analytics. And in this case, uh, this particular CMB community was really interested in creating a full-sky map of cosmic microwave background radiation. And they wanted to run this code at full scale on Cori, so about 600,000 cores. And fundamentally, just booting up the code, just running the code at scale was, was not possible for them. But Shifter was really the key technology that they used to enable the code to start up, to enable the Python code to start up on uh, 600,000 cores, uh, 600,000 KNL cores. And that is really what enabled the, uh, the code to actually run at scale. And we optimized certainly the, the CMB code a lot with uh, Intel's help as well. Now, Jupyter is, again, a, a key trend, something that we cannot ignore anymore in, in science. I uh, just want to give you a few highlights from the communities that we work with. So in UC Berkeley, the campus that's right next to us, the largest class ever taught in, in the history of UC Berkeley was Foundations of Data Science. Hundreds of students uh, routinely signing up. Um, and essentially, um, this whole class is taught with Jupyter Notebooks. So I think it's a fair assumption that tomorrow's data scientists are going to be using Notebooks and Jupyter, perhaps, to learn data science and also conduct their analysis in the future. In, uh, earlier, I guess, in the year, um, uh, Jupyter won the ACM Systems uh, Prize for you know, key innovation on, on the software front. At NERSC, certainly, there are a number of different data science projects, um, uh, LSST, DESI, ALS, LCLS, so on and so forth, that use Jupyter uh, in, in production. Um, and you know, the, the image on the bottom right is essentially a, a notebook that captures the analysis that was done by the, the LIGO instrument. So essentially, apart from publishing a paper, an important paper, uh, communities are now publishing notebooks as well that you can have a look at. Uh, Jupyter really matters. Again, every year, much like other supercomputing centers, we conduct surveys and we solicit feedback from our users. And again, you get a lot of uniformly positive feedback on, on uh, the importance of Jupyter for enabling users' workflows. So I mentioned over 600 users use Jupyter at NERSC. Every day, more than 150 users routinely use Jupyter. So it's one of the more uh, popular uh, services that we provide uh, at, at NERSC. In the future, we think that Jupyter is going to be the way people do interactive supercomputing. So again, the way simulation users have interacted with typical HPC systems is that they configure an input deck for a simulation code, submit their job, cross their fingers, hope that it runs in three days or so, and come back and check on things. But more and more, that's not really the paradigm that data science users adopt. Uh, essentially, what they want to be doing is to develop their code in the context of a notebook. Uh, that notebook runs on their laptop. Potentially, it runs on the cloud. Why should it not run on an HPC system? So we've been working behind the scenes on making sure that we have uh, the system architected so that you can essentially launch uh, compute jobs on the computational infrastructure and report back results to the, to the notebook. So this is active work uh, in development. And at this point in time, I would say that we can certainly launch compute jobs, but then also run deep learning jobs uh, through such notebooks. So, so that's two bits of production infrastructure which we find to be really important, uh, container technologies and notebook interfaces. Just focusing on the rest of the analytics stack for the rest of the talk, um, performance and productivity is really quite essential. Um, so on this caricature, on the y-axis, we have a number of users that we think um, are going to be using the stack going forward. Uh, the mode of this distribution is likely going to be in the order 10 terabyte, order 10,000 core marks. So I think that's where we expect most of our data analytics users to lie. Uh, but certainly on the capability end of the spectrum, uh, the question is what sort of technologies are really going to make it there? So are you going to have a highly productive 
stack you know, that, that subscribes to the first two slices in this curve, but then maybe you're going to give up on those technologies and fall back to CN Fortran in the capability regime, or are we going to actually have a hope of scaling these productive technologies all the way to the right? So clearly, I think asking the question of what are the capability applications in the data space, what's going to be our software strategy, how do we best use the existing HPC hardware, that is what led us to the, the big data center collaboration. So in, in, in a nutshell, the mission was to solve DOE's leading data-intensive science problems at scale on Cori. And uh, the mechanism for that would essentially be uh, conducting work jointly with Intel and Cray uh, in doing performance optimization and scaling of production technologies, so production data analytics and production data management technologies. We don't want to create prototypes that we just throw and move on after publishing a paper. We want to make sure that we take the technologies that are actually used by users and then we get them to scale um, on, on Cori. So next I'm going to go into four case studies wherein we've actually uh, taken some uh, challenging science problems and then we've scaled out the respective technology to get it to work on Cori. So we're going to start with Celeste first. Uh, so Celeste is uh, a joint project between us at NERSC and uh, UC Berkeley, Harvard, um, MIT, and Julia Computing. Uh, Jeff Regier is the, is the lead for this project. Uh, he's on the job market at this point in time. Um, he's uh, looking for academic jobs. So if you're looking for a world-class machine learning, deep learning statist uh, statistical expert who can cross the bridge between uh, domain sciences and HPC and methods, he's, he's your guy. So if you're in a university environment, you know, do, uh, do pay attention. So uh, the, the science driver for the Celeste project uh, comes from astronomy. And essentially what we are trying to do here is to get our hands on all the, all the telescope data that we can find and infer or create a unified catalog, a catalog of all visible objects in the universe. The methodology that we're going to adopt is going to be uh, statistical modeling and, and graphical models in particular. So we've worked for two years with astronomers in articulating a graphical model, which is shown on the right, which essentially captures a parametric representation of what an idealized star or an idea, idealized galaxy might look like, and then how that galaxy or, or a star in the sky might result in a certain amount of photon counts on your CCD sensor. So all of the choices of how the object is parameterized, the conditional relationships, all of those have been signed off by an astronomer. When you work this out, when you work out how many parameters we need to infer from a trillion pixels, this turns out to be one of the largest graphical models in science. And estimating about two billion parameters or so is one of the largest inference problems. So really at scale, uh, only two methods statistically can make it. Uh, one is MCMC, the other is variational inference. So we implemented uh, an, an approach based in variational inference uh, and had some second order optimization in it that could essentially work at this particular scale. One of the more interesting aspects of this particular problem was that the statisticians decide to, decided to code this whole framework in Julia. Uh, they wanted that because they wanted the flexibility to swap out the statistical model as we went along. So we really wanted to uh, make sure that they would stick to the Julia language for their, um, uh, for their coding, and we would not ask them to code anything really in C or Fortran or, or what have you. So Julia, just in case you, you do not know, is a, is a potential solution to the two programming language paradigms. Again, increasingly scientists turn to a high-level language like Python for, for their data analysis, but then when it comes to performance critical parts, they implement that in C or Fortran. Uh, Julia is, is, a, is a solution to that. Um, so essentially, in, in, the con in the context of one language, you can certainly stitch together a high-level workflow, but then you don't really suffer in terms of performance. So a number of interesting features in, in Julia around, uh, for the Celeste project around supporting uh, automatic differentiation, transparently switching between different data layouts, uh, and the compiler can do a lot of the vectorization and optimization for you for free. So we implemented Celeste and Julia. We came up with schemes for multi-node scaling, load balancing, so on and so forth. And in the end, uh, the Celeste model does really well. So along uh, many different metrics and how you measure uh, the accuracy of a certain galaxy and so on, uh, across the board, we do fairly well. And then we can scale this out to um, 8,000 plus nodes. So for uh, a large data set from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that was about 55 terabytes in size, uh, we were able to complete this inference uh, in, uh, in 15 minutes. Over the course of this run, we actually moved a petabyte of data over Cori's network. So it's not really easy to do that um, at scale. 
And the, the state of the, the catalog that we ended up with uh, has, has uh, state of the art estimates, point estimates, as well as uncertainty estimates for 100, uh, 188 million different stars and galaxies. Uh, you know, from a CS perspective, I think what was more uh, really quite impressive was that the Julia code was running on 650,000 KNL cores, uh, utilizing 1.3 million threads. And this is the first Julia app that could exceed a petaflop of, of performance. Uh, a different project, so this was from SC17 last year on taking deep learning and scaling it out again to all of Cori. So this, this, uh, the work was all done 18 months ago, which feels like an eternity in, in, uh, in the deep learning time frame. And again, this was a strong collaboration between NERSC and Intel and Stanford. So in this case, the, the science driver comes from climate science. So um, you know, as was mentioned earlier as well, it's fairly easy for climate scientists to configure a simulation that, that explores how different carbon emission scenarios uh, will play out in 100 years or so. But the challenge essentially that you end up with is that you now have a 100 terabyte data set that you need to analyze. There's no way that climate scientists are going to sit in front of a movie that plays out for 100 years and manually find features by hand. You really need an automated tool uh, to automatically extract extreme weather patterns. So in this particular study, what we wanted to do was the following. So, I mean, this is an analogy between the kinds of problems that people solve in the commercial world with YouTube videos. Um, you want to find cats and dogs in, in images. Uh, in climate science context, we have multivariate spatiotemporal data, and you want to be able to detect multiple objects in a global, global image. So the object detection problem is the one that we're going to try to solve uh, in this particular project. So we used a semi-supervised convolutional architecture. So there is an encoder piece that takes a, a million pixel image with multiple channels and comes up with a compact representation of features. Uh, and then in the bottom, essentially, you ask the network to predict labels or bounding boxes for known patterns. So that's a fairly classical uh, supervised convolutional architecture. But there is a twist in this particular architecture in that there's also a decoder piece. So operating off the same bottleneck layer, you ask the network to produce uh, an output field that matches the dimensionality of the input field. If you can do this, so if you can simultaneously minimize the reconstruction error going from left to right and maximize the predictive accuracy going from left to the middle to the bottom, uh, then the network has most likely learned uh, the most relevant representation of features in the bottleneck layer. So we worked with researchers at Miller to design this network, and we got it to scale. We, we got it to converge. Um, the, the software in this case used was Intel Cafe. So uh, this is uh, you know, a contemporary deep learning stack. Uh, so again, uh, about 18 months ago, we felt that we could really pull this off in, in Cafe, and it was a little harder to get TensorFlow and PyTorch to, to work well at that point in time. Uh, the Intel MLSL team worked with us in making sure that the multi-node synchronization was efficient. Uh, a lot of stuff had to be um, optimized in the MKL DNN library, so that was all, all good stuff. And then we ran on, on, uh, on Cori KNL for this particular project. So uh, the Intel team, again, did a fantastic job in, in optimizing uh, several different layers of this architecture. So this, this figure captures the single load performance that we got at the end of the day. The red stars are the percentage time that's spent in various layers. And then the, the vertical black bars are uh, performance as measured in, in teraflops. So overall, um, the network is able to achieve around two teraflops. Uh, remember that the, the theoretical peak for Cori KNL uh, is about six teraflops on a node basis. So this is a fairly high fraction of peak. And uh, more importantly, by the time we were done with this project, uh, all the, the pathways for convolutional layers and then also the deconvolutional layers in MKL were highly optimized. So we were able to roll this back in production so that the rest of the community could, could benefit from that. So these were the final results. Again, the, the image on the top left is, uh, shows the ground truth uh, boxes for three different atmospheric patterns in green. And then red is what the network predicts. So a single network is able to find multiple kinds of weather patterns in, in the data set. On the top right is, um, is the weak scaling plot. So again, we had to innovate on um, uh, using a hybrid synchronization scheme, synchronous scaling. Uh, goes only so far uh, for, for deep learning. So we came up with a hybrid scheme wherein we mixed async and sync uh, synchronization. And uh, this is a weak scaling plot. So using that, we were certainly able to weak scale the problem out. So reasonable results, I would say, were obtained for the climate problem. Uh, this is still, I think, the, one of the largest cafe runs on a CPU-only system. And uh, overall, we were able to obtain, obtain uh, 13, pera uh, 13 petaflops sustained and then 15 petaflops uh, peak on 9,600 nodes. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our intention was always to release whatever we'd done back to the community. So all of the enhancements that we made for MLSL, <coughs> Intel Cafe, and MKL DNN were released, released back to the community. Moving on to a slightly different problem. So this is a problem that comes from cosmology. It's a, we're going to use the deep learning approach again, but this is a very different problem. The, the challenge here is to uh, characterize or determine the fundamental constants of cosmology. So again, um, people characterize cosmology to theoretical models, and theoretical models have a few numbers, so six to 10 numbers that they use. Uh, how much dark matter do you have? How much dark energy do you have? So on and so forth. And uh, there is a, an open question regarding what are the settings, assuming that you trust the theoretical model, what are the settings of these numbers when we look out at the universe that we observe? So one of the approaches that you can certainly take is to utilize computational models. You can configure many different universes with different choices of cosmological constants. So you have training data, uh, a, a simulated universe, and the cosmological constant that went into it. And you can frame this as a regression problem. Uh, can essentially a deep, deep net uh, take, operate on 3D volumetric data and produce cosmological constants? So this is a paper that appears in supercomputing. So uh, Amrita and Debbie are going to be uh, presenting the paper later this week. So please drop by their talk if you'd like. And certainly, this is a strong collaboration between NERSC and Intel and Cray and UC Berkeley uh, in, in uh, pulling off this result. So we chose to go with a 3D convolution network. So again, you're operating on a 3D volumetric data set. Um, you know, while a lot of deep learning is done for 2D images, 3D data sets are, are common to science. Um, so in this particular case, we had a uh, volume filled with uh, dark matter par particles. So I'll, I'll note that a group from CMU are really the first ones, uh, led by uh, Ravan Baksh, um, uh, who realized that you could frame this as a, a regression problem, and you can have 3D convolutional networks essentially solve this problem. When they tried to solve it for uh, two uh, cosmological constants, they quickly found that they ran into serious computational issues. They didn't have enough computational horsepower. They couldn't handle large data sets. So essentially what we did this time around for the CosmoFlow work was to operate on much larger data sets and to scale it out on uh, essentially all of the Cori uh, KNL system. So the stack that we used in this case was uh, TensorFlow. So again, things have moved substantially, I would say, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, CAFE has slightly fallen out of favor with the deep learning community. Uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch are definitely the, the, the go-to frameworks for, uh, for doing deep learning. Now, we also use the, the Cray plugin. So again, we work closely with Cray in, in making sure that multi-node communication could happen uh, efficiently. So the Cray plugin is what we use, which in turn uses MPI. Um, we worked with Intel to make sure that 3D convolutions were supported well in, in MKLDNN. And then finally, again, we ran this project on, uh, on the Cori KNL system. So single node performance, um, uh, again, the, the, the bar plots on the right show how 68 cores are used. So most of the work is done uh, in OpenMP. So 63 cores are set aside for, for doing the 3D convolution. We set aside a few cores for doing the MPI communication. Um, and then one core is set aside for, for handling I.O. stuff. So, uh, so overall, I think by the time the Intel team was done optimizing 3D convolutions, we'd obtain about 1,000x speed up from where the project was when we started. And the larger convolutions were able to achieve more than a teraflop on a single uh, KNL node. Uh, but then overall, when you add up the time spent in I.O. and, and the, the multi-node synchronization, uh, we were obtaining about a half a teraflop on, uh, on a single KNL node. So that's a respectable level of performance uh, for this particular workload. I mentioned the, the Cray plugin. So, um, as opposed to the parameter server approach that's used by gRPC and, and TensorFlow, uh, we figured out that um, uh, you know, this, we really don't need the separate parameter servers, which typically end, end up being a bottleneck for, for scaling deep learning. Uh, all of this can be done in the context of an MPI uh, operation. And of course, you know, Cray knows, knows MPI really well. So they've designed a plugin wherein uh, you just need to overload a few calls in your, uh, in your network's um, description. And then uh, supporting data parallelism with synchronous updates can be done transparently. Uh, and, and the plugin really works quite, quite well. So these are some of the final results. Um, the, the different uh, plots show our parameter up updates, uh, our parameter estimates for different three uh, cosmological constants. The, the vertical line is the ground truth. And the red dots are what the converged network is able to predict. 
So in general, the, uh, the, uh, the network's predictions uh, match up to, to ground truth fairly well. And in, in particular, when you compare it to what the field has been using so far, uh, there's certainly a significant performance improvement in the accuracy of, uh, of, of the estimates. From a CS perspective, the Cosmoflow network was scaled out to 8,000 nodes. Uh, we got about 77% scaling efficiency and 3.5 uh, petaflops sustained performance. Uh, and again, this is, this, this is the, the largest TensorFlow run attempted on a CPU system with synchronous updates. So we're quite proud of that in that you can still stick to a high-level framework like TensorFlow and get fairly high levels of performance on, a, on an HPC system. Uh, similar to the 15 petaflop story, uh, all of the enhancements that we've done to the uh, 3D convolutional uh, support in MKLDNN and also uh, to the Cray plugin have now been uh, deployed back in production. So again, you're welcome to drop by the uh, Amrita and Debbie's SC talk later in the week if you'd like more details. I want to shift to a, a different project, which is technically not quite a part of the Big Data Center collaboration, but um, this is a part of our NESAP, the NERSC Exascale Application Readiness Program, uh, wherein we took uh, image processing code from the DESI project. So the DESI stands for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Um, the, the goal here is uh, broadly to understand dark energy, um, and uh, essentially, we'd like to be able to create detailed 3D maps. Um, and this is a production project. So again, unlike some of the hero runs that I just talked about, uh, DESI really cares about production code running on our production system. And this, uh, this work is led by Roland Thomas, um, who's uh, Mr. Python and Mr. Jupiter for NERSC. Uh, Laurie Steffi is, a, is an up-and-coming postdoc uh, in, in the NISA program. And then there's a big collaboration that, that supports uh, this work. Now, the DESI project is interesting in the sense that there is a directive from the project in that we are not going to be coding in C or Fortran. Every single thing has to be coded in Python. Um, uh, the, the project goes online next year, um, um, so there is an urgency to get the code to run fast on, on KNL. Uh, the developer community in this case values um, developer time and software maintainability issues much, much more than compute performance. So it was really quite key for them to develop clear, maintainable code. That's an explicit priority for this project. And they did not want to code anything in C or, or Cython. But they do want the code to be running faster. So Laurie, Steffi, and, and Rollin worked with Sergey Madinov's team in the Intel Python group. And uh, they spent a lot of time in profiling, uh, where the, the time was being spent. Uh, they used a range of different profiling tools. And when the time came for uh, performance critical sections for the DESI project, uh, they used number and JIT compiling to speed up the code um, to, uh, to essentially get better performance. So uh, overall, uh, over the course of the past, I would say, year or two, uh, the, De the DESI code has been sped up by a factor of 7 to 10 uh, without rewriting in C. So we've stuck to Python. Um, and a range of different optimizations have now been added. So optimizing Python, native Python, is possible. It just takes some effort. Um, but again, the, the support that the Intel Python team has rendered for this particular project has been invaluable for us. All right, so I'm going to conclude uh, now that you know, we've gone through a few case studies. I want to make some conclu concluding remarks. This is an internal leaderboard of sorts that we maintain at NERSC. Um, you know, it doesn't apply to the broad community, but, but certainly is something that we track internally. So starting 2016, for the past two or three years, we've now worked systematically with Intel and Cray to produce some of the largest um, analytics capabilities that, that we are aware of. So the first two projects, BDCATS and Galactos, were all implemented in C, C++, MPI, um, for doing clustering, for doing three-point correlation. To the best of my knowledge, uh, and they may have been superseded by other methods, uh, these are some of the largest computations that have ever been attempted. So for clustering, we've been able to cluster a trillion particles on 100,000 plus cores, and we've completed that in about 30 minutes. For computing three-point correlation, which is supposed to be intractable, uh, the Galactos project was able to compute, complete this computation for two billion galaxies on, on a large fraction of Cori, and we were able to compute this in, in about 20 minutes. Now, since then, we've moved on to higher productivity languages. So the Celeste project I mentioned is all in Julia. And it's the first Julia application to exceed a petaflop running on uh, 550,000 cores. In this case, we took a massive data set, about 55 terabytes of data, a petabyte of data moved over the network, and the analysis is completed in 15 minutes. I'll note that going forward, certainly deep learning is going to have a, a more and more important role, but you, you're going to have statisticians 
who want to use statistical inference at scale. So uh, Celeste, in many ways, is representative of a bleeding edge project in that space. So then we moved on to deep learning. We started with CAFE. We moved on to TensorFlow. And in both cases, um, in terms of a CAFE run on a CPU system and a TensorFlow run on a CPU system, uh, these are some of the largest runs that have been attempted. So we're really quite proud of um, you know, all, of, all of these accomplishments. So um, you know, one key thing is, is also that productive technologies can be scaled on HPC systems. Um, uh, so again, over the last years or so, we've taken CAFE, we've taken Julia, we've taken TensorFlow, and we've certainly scaled them out to what I would call is the capability regime. Uh, we had a separate project with Cray on looking at Spark and, uh, and optimizing and scaling Spark out. So we were able to run Spark on the, the Haswell partition. Um, next year, we are looking at uh, pushing a little bit harder on Python and PyTorch, because again, PyTorch is an emerging framework for deep learning that lets you express dynamic computations and uh, graph computations quite elegantly. So that's the framework that we're going to be looking at uh, next. So a few concluding remarks. Um, first, data intensive science is well established at NERSC. Um, I think five years ago, we, we certainly saw that trend coming. Um, we, we reacted, we got the data stack in order, we've been monitoring the usage of the stack, and at this point in time, if I had to measure how many users are using that stack, different tools, different technologies, so on and so forth, that number is about 3,500. So about half of our users are routinely exercising the data stack at NERSC. Both performance and productivity are key, so uh, you know, one doesn't have to make hard compromises one way or the other. Uh, different technologies have been scaled out on Cori KNL. We have reasons to believe that a lot of the work that we've done in extracting parallelism, in optimizing uh, the, the methods and scaling them out, will carry over from Xeon Phi to, to Xeon architectures. But certainly a lot of innovation has been required across the entire stack. So certainly machine learning and deep learning are enabling completely a new class of scientific applications. Uh, there's going to be yet more innovation in the method space for sure. Uh, but we do have to pay attention to the software and hardware layers as well. So, uh, so I think it's really only in close collaboration between academia, who tend to be stronger in method development, uh, places like Garment Labs, which are home to big machines and, and software stacks, and the industry in you know, Intel and Cray, in, in the case of Cori, uh, wherein we've been able to really pull off this, uh, th these kinds of results. So for us, the big data center model has been really uh, successful, I would say. Uh, you know, I think we've been able to uh, look at the stack, optimize it, scale it out, and at the same time, it's been productive for, for all of our users. And you, know, you and the, the audience that might be operating in different uh, HPC centers and so on and so forth may potentially learn from, uh, from what we've done here. So I think that's all I had to say. Any, I can take any questions, I guess. So there's a couple of questions. Uh, you shared some great examples of real uh, scientific breakthroughs uh, that focus on big data. Uh, as the intersection of HPC and AI grows, uh, why should portability, performance, and productivity matter to the developers in the scientific community? So, so maybe just commenting on the data-intensive science community and the developers associated with that. Um, you know, we really don't see them changing the paradigm in which they operate when they move from one supercomputing center to another. I mentioned, you know, the, the, the fact is that many of these developers are used to operating in the context of a notebook, and they do expect things to transparently work on the cloud backend and, and on their laptops. Just because the backend happens to be an HPC system with CPUs, GPUs, other, other flavors of accelerators, why should they change the way they program things? So, so anyways, I think <clears throat> all of the performance issues, portability issues that the Exascale program has taken seriously, I think all of those requirements now apply to data science as well. In particular, as the data sets sizes get larger, that people are not able to fit data sets on a single laptop anymore, and they absolutely need an HPC system to scale problems out, they will demand that. Second question would be, uh, what additional advice would you give the developer, developer uh, and scientific community as they prepare for applications to handle uh, the big data era? Sure. So I think, um, you know, so far the talk focused a lot on analytics. There was a bias on analytics, and I think the, the, main, the main point I wanted to get across was that productive technologies can be performant. Uh, so I think we are moving well along in that space. Um, but really, 
analytics production or capability uh, size analytics is just one part of the complex scientific workflow. So we know now that things on the data management side are, are falling apart. Uh, Luster, GPFS are just not keeping up. So uh, making sure that the IO stack actually keeps up when the analytics runs on, on compute hardware, that's key. But then even taking a step up and thinking about the entire workflow, you know, when you think about data streaming in from satellites or microscopes or other instruments, uh, you know, we, we need to think about the network. How does the network, um, how, how does data get moved into the network? How does resource scheduling happen? Uh, how does the data move over the internal network on a supercomputing system to something like the burst buffer or the memory of a compute node? Um, intelligent scheduling becomes more relevant. Automatic scheduling becomes more relevant. So I think just understanding that the, the modern scientific workflow is going to be more than just a hero capability run uh, is, is going to be quite key. So I think uh, complex workflows, I would say, is, is, is the thing to keep in mind. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. Thanks.